Welcome to the show, podcast world. It's time for episode 359 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode of the show is brought to you by the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at dankseed.store. I like to start the podcast off by letting you know what I'm smoking. Today, I'm taking dabs of Bubble Jack Full Spectrum Extract from Fuego Extracts. I really love the flavor and aroma of this concentrate. It smells like jack hair and bubble gum. And when you dab it, it leaves a sweet, soft bubble gum flavor on your mouth that just lingers for a long time. And the high goes straight to the head. I really like this concentrate. One thing I am going to complain about is the packaging. These little plastic jars get stuck. The Fuego jars get stuck every time I buy them. It is a pain in the ass. Then they're putting the jar inside of a black bag with a drawstring kind of like a little tiny crown royal bag. The jar has stickers on it to indicate the brand and the strain. The little black bag has a bunch of fibers that come off of it. So now I've got a jar that looks like it's got long black hairs hanging off of it. I don't like that at all. It's unappealing. There's no need for that bag. It's a waste of material. It's another step in the packaging process, and it is completely useless. Then after they've put the jar in that bag, they place that bag inside of another box, which slides into another box, which is all beautifully decorated and well-labeled. It is a lot of packaging. I'm sure most of that packaging is because of the Colorado compliance laws, but I would like to see less packaging from the concentrate companies. I feel like I throw away a lot of packaging. All right, you guys. So let me be completely clear. The concentrate is amazing. The Bubble Jack Full Spectrum Extract tastes great. The high is perfect. My only complaint is with the packaging. And that is not just Fuego. I just happen to be using Fuego products today when I'm talking about this. A lot of the companies are using too much packaging. And I understand it's Colorado law. We've got to be compliant. I get it. I just wish there was a way we could do this more efficiently and more environmentally friendly. All right, you guys, let's move forward with the show. This is going to be another grow lesson. This is going to be the seventh lesson in a long series of grow lessons. In this episode, I want to talk about planning your integrated pest management. Everybody likes to think they will not get bugs. Everybody likes to say that's not going to happen to me, but guess what? It will. And the only way you can prevent it is by starting an integrated pest management system while you're planning your grow, while you're setting up your grow, and having it in place before you ever introduce plants into your grow environment. Now, let's talk a little bit about integrated pest management. What is the goal of our integrated pest management system? The ultimate goal is to keep our garden free of pests and bugs. A good spot to start would be knowing how to identify the bugs we are looking for and the damage that they will leave. Now, what insects are we going to find in our cannabis garden? The most common problem we are going to find is spider mites. Spider mites are very small. You are very unlikely to see a spider mite unless you flip over a leaf and look at it and do some investigating. What you will see is spider mite damage. If you've got a leaf that looks like somebody has just been taking a needle, and poking little dots in that leaf, or something's been sticking its fangs in there and sucking the juice out of those little spots, that is spider mite damage. Learn how to identify spider mite damage. If you see damage on a leaf, pull that leaf off, flip it upside down, and look at the underside of the leaf. Along the main vein of that leaf, tucked right up against that vein, you will see spider mites and spider mite eggs. Those little dots you see, those are spider mite eggs. Those little itty bitty dots that are moving, those are the spider mites. They are there. It is time to treat for them. Depending on what cycle of growth you are in, treating for spider mites can be very easy. It can also be kind of a pain in the ass later in flower. If you learn how to identify spider mite damage and learn how to identify spider mites, finding the problem early and correcting it should not be a problem before it gets out of hand. Another pest that is very common in the garden and very easy to identify because of its damage is a thrip. A lot like a spider mite, the thrips like to suck the juice out of our plants. After they do this, they leave a little trail of gooey stuff called honeydew on the leaves. If you see a little trail of silvery, shiny, shimmery stuff left on your lower leaves, you probably have thrips. If we become familiar with what thrip damage looks like, we can identify the problem sooner, and that makes it really easy to eradicate our problems. So my point is, knowing what to look for will be seriously advantageous when it comes to treating for a pest problem. Another common pest you're going to run into is the white fly. What does a white fly look like? It looks like a little piece of ash just flying around, just a little white fly. It'll start off with two of them. Then the next day you'll see 200 of them. Then the next day you'll see 2,000 of them. White flies multiply rapidly, but 
Once you see them, they are easy to get rid of if you understand how to combat them. So the very first step of an integrated pest management system is learning to identify the damage caused by common garden pests. Once we know how to identify the problems, then we can identify the pest, then we can decide on the course of action to treat that problem. Also, it is very important to treat for the correct pest. Some pesticides will work on a broad spectrum of pests, but if you're using specific pesticides or if you're using specific predatory pests, you do need to use the correct method of attack. In today's market, we can't afford to spend money on a product that does not specifically attack our problem, and also we can't spend time applying a product or releasing predators that are not going to get in there and eradicate our problems. So learn how to identify the signs, then identify the actual pest, then we can dial in and attack to eradicate our problem. Now let's talk about a few ways we can prepare our grow and prevent pests from entering our new garden. Cleanliness is a huge factor when it comes to keeping bugs out of our garden. Everything that goes in that garden is taken in there by you. You travel in and out of there, you take things in and out, it is your responsibility to control what goes in and out of that grow. One way to prevent contaminating your garden is to have dedicated garden clothes. Don't come from a hike, don't come from the grow store, don't come from work, don't go from wherever you are into your grow room. Have specific garden clothes. Change your clothes, change your shoes, change your hat. Don't take your daily clothing into your grow room. Who knows what's on you? Maybe you've been petting a dog. Maybe the dog was outside leaning against the tree. Maybe that tree had aphids. A dog came in, rubbed up against your leg. You and the dog spent a minute together scratching on each other. Then you went to the grow. You just took those aphids from the tree to the dog into your garden. Try to prevent that sort of thing. Be very careful. I've got dreadlocks down to my knees. I wrap my dreadlocks up in a specific hat before I go into any grow. If you've got dreadlocks or long hair, I suggest you put it in a hat of some sort, maybe a hairnet, whatever it takes. My hair would not fit in a hairnet. I wrap my dreads in a big bun on top of my head. I wrap that in a piece of material that wraps real tight. Then I slide a dreadlock hat over that. So I'm double wrapped. Nothing will get in. Nothing will get out. I won't transfer any problems from grow to grow or room to room. So if you've got dreadlocks or long hair, I highly recommend you keep it wrapped up maybe in a hairnet or something similar, maybe a dread hat just where it's contained in there and not exposed. That way you can prevent moving spider mites around through your hair. And some of you guys with the big beards, you may want to consider a beard net also, not just to prevent the bugs from getting into our hair, but also to prevent our hair from sticking to the buds. Nobody wants to buy a bud with a big hair in it. So change your clothes, keep your hair tied up, and then let's get back to that dog I was talking about. I don't recommend having pets in the grow room. I see a lot of pictures of people with their dog or their cat in the grow room talking about it's their, their guard dog or their mascot. That's cool if you want to do that, but I don't recommend it. Like I said earlier, your dog or your cat goes outside, it rolls around in the dirt, it rolls around in the bushes, it just goes everywhere. Who knows what it's getting into? Then you let it walk right into the garden. Maybe it walked up right up against a plant that was covered in spider mites and you had no idea. Now that dog is in your garden rubbing up against your plants. Guess what? Free spider mites for everybody. I don't recommend having a pet in the grow. If you insist, do your thing. That is your grow. But in my opinion, that is a huge risk for bringing bugs into your garden. Another thing I would recommend is that if you've got an outdoor grow and an indoor grow, don't bring your tools from that outdoor grow into your indoor grow environment. You may be bringing problems. And sometimes I know I sound like I might just be paranoid, but it's better to be paranoid than to make stupid mistakes. Now, as long as you're changing your clothes, you're keeping your hair clean, you're keeping your shoes and your equipment clean, and you're not letting your dog or your friends in your grow room, there shouldn't be a way for any pests to get into this grow. You may have some cracks in the walls. There may be gaps in your building. That's always going to happen but we're not going to drag them in there on our own. If they find a way in, we will deal with that. Now, once you're certain you've minimized the opportunity for pests to enter your grow through your own doing, we need to think about treating the clones that come into our grow before they are introduced to population. Wherever your clones come from, if it's your best friend, if it's a dispensary, if it's some guy on Instagram, wherever they came from, treat them as if they are contaminated with some sort of pest issue. Never introduce clones into your general population without some sort of quarantine period. If your room is brand new, you don't have bugs. Why take plants in there that have bugs on them? We can treat those plants before we take them into our main grow room. 
If you've got a room with plants going, why would you want to introduce a plant with bugs on it into that room to contaminate the entire grow? If you get clones from anybody, isolate them, quarantine them, investigate them, get a jeweler's loop and go over the leaves and see if you can see any signs of bugs on the top or bottoms of those leaves. If you see any pests, now you have to decide if you want to keep that clone or if you're going to treat it and try to eradicate that problem before you introduce that clone to your general population. If I got a clone that had bugs on it, I would probably throw it away unless it were some super elite cut that I could never get again. Why start with problems? I wouldn't even allow that to make it past quarantine. If it looked like it was clean, I would still probably treat it. I would treat it with whatever pest management system I have decided to work with. If I'm using sprays and oils, I would heavily treat it with multiple oils several times. It would probably spend a week in quarantine. The first day, it would get blasted with something. On day three, it would get blasted with something different. On day five, something different. Then we're going to look at it. If I feel like it's safe and clean, it may enter general population on day seven, or it may get treated one more time, depending on how it looks to me. If I were working in a facility that did not use spray applications, I would put that plant in an isolated area with enough light and living conditions to survive for a few days, and then I would start heavily applying beneficial insects. I would build up a colony of predators on there. Hopefully, they would go through and eat anything that was causing me a problem, and by day seven, I would be safe to enter that clone into general population. But honestly, if I got a clone and it was contaminated, I probably would just destroy it. It wouldn't even make it past the inspection stage. It wouldn't even get into my grow. So as a grower, it is your responsibility to check incoming clones and check them thoroughly, no matter where they came from. If it came from your best friend, if it came from a dispensary, if it came from somebody on the internet, it is your responsibility. You cannot blame anybody for giving you a clone with bugs. That is your fault. It is not their fault. So treat any incoming plants as if they are contaminated. Isolate them, treat them, and continue to monitor them until you are certain the problem is not there or has been eradicated. Now, another very common way for people to get garden pests is through store-bought soil or soilless mix. A lot of people try to blame specific brands for being infested with specific bugs. I find that to be inaccurate. Think about it this way. Brand A is made in one area in California. Brand B is probably made in another area of California. And brand C, we'll just say that it's manufactured in Colorado. So all three of those brands are made. Then they're all shipped to a warehouse. Sometimes these warehouses store their soil in pallets outdoors. Now, if one of those pallets had a little bit of bugs in it, they started thriving in that one pallet of soil. Then they moved over to the next pallet. Then they moved over to the next pallet. Now they are in brands A, B, and C. There is no way to blame a specific soil company for giving you bugs. It was probably the warehouse in which all of those pallets were stored is where your bugs came from. So let's try to get away from blaming a specific brand for having specific bugs in there. That's unfair and probably inaccurate. But it is a fact that our soil does come with bugs quite frequently. A lot of times you'll notice this when you're transplanting. You'll stick your hand in there and a little bug will just fly right up. It's usually a fungus gnat or a white fly. It'll just fly right up out of the soil. You know they're there. Now it's time to start thinking about how you are going to treat for those pests. Other times, you don't see those soil-borne pests until the first time you water. You just potted all those pots. You got a whole bag worth of soil worth of up pots done. You're feeling really good about life. You got the grow room all organized. You mix up your nutrients. You go to water. And that first batch of water that hits that soil, you see little bugs come flying out. Those are fresh bugs. They came fresh with the soil. They're not a big deal as long as we know how to identify the insect and we know how to properly treat for that problem. Treating for soil-bound pests is very easy. You can either purchase predator insects that will get in there and eat that specific pest, or we can mix up a root drench, which is a basic pesticide, and you mix it with water, and then you water that into the plants just like you would when you normally water. Then that pesticide gets down in there in the root zone, and then it will eradicate any pests that are in there. The things you're most commonly going to find in soil are going to be white flies. You'll probably find some fungus gnats, and I quite often have found thrips in my soil. So just know that your soil may have bugs in it. Be aware, be looking, and be prepared. And once you see some pests, identify them, then start thinking about eradication strategies. I do plan on giving you options for eradication strategies, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. There are countless options and variables when it comes to deciding your integrated pest management, but I want to give you guidance to let you decide and modify your own pest management system 
to where it fits with your grow style, with your grow environment, and also it's got to fit your budget. So I'm going to give you a good guideline on how to take care of pests in your garden, but it is up to you to implement and modify these practices to work for you. All right, so we've covered most of the ways that we are going to introduce pests into a grow. Let's talk about the other ways pests are going to find their way into the grow. They're going to come in through your venting and your ducting. If you have any spots that are not sealed up, a spider mite or a little bug could just wiggle its way right through there. It's going to smell that sweet ganja plant. It's going to feel that warmth from the light and it's going to go, man, I want to be in there. And it's going to just go that way and then it's going to tell all of its friends, hey, bro, I found a way in and they're just going to start parading in. So any cracks or gaps in your structure need to be sealed. If you can find a gap or a crack or a hole of some sort, put some caulk in there, put some tape over it, seal it up super tight so that the bugs cannot get in there. Now, it's ideal to have a completely sealed room, but I understand that that is not always a viable option. Since we do have the opportunity to get bugs in there, our next step is to have a way to monitor and indicate the presence of pests. And the easiest way and most affordable and cost-effective way to do that is first by scouting. You need to spend time every day looking through your garden to see if you see any signs of bugs or bug damage. Scouting for bugs is free. It just takes time. Depending on the size of your grow, this could take anywhere from five minutes to a full hour. But it is important work. Put on some good music, get in the zone, and scout for pests. Train everybody in the grow how to identify signs of pests, and also teach them how to identify which pests they're dealing with. If you do discover pests, have a way to mark the plant, and also mark on paper where it was in the facility. You probably have row numbers or room numbers. Or if it's just a home grow, just plant number three or the plant in the middle, just kind of mark down roughly where it is and then start thinking of a strategy. If you're not the one in charge of pest management, make sure you report that to the person above you. So just make a note of it. Write down what you found, what it looks like, what pest you think it is, and then start doing research on how do we eradicate that pest, start coming up with options. So scouting for bugs is free. You walk the rows, you turn the leaves upside down, you look, you look low in the canopy, you look high in the canopy, you look around. Feel free to pull a few leaves off. If you can't get a good look, reach in there, pop off a few leaves. Look at those under your scope. See if you see anything. You should be scouting for pests on a regular basis with some sort of a strategy. Now, while you're out scouting for pests, you should check your yellow sticky cards. Every grow should have yellow sticky cards, and they should be checked frequently and changed frequently as well. Yellow sticky cards are exactly what I'm saying. They're little yellow cards. They're about four inches by four inches or maybe four inches by six inches, and they are bright yellow and they are sticky. They've got a disgusting glue on them that if you touch it, it's going to take all day to get that stuff off of you. Don't get one stuck to your elbow when you're working in the grow. If you've done it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you do it, you'll go, ah, that's what he meant. But you should have yellow sticky traps all over the grow. I like to put yellow sticky traps low down by the soil so that if I get any soil bound pests coming up out of the dirt, I get indicators of that. I like to put yellow sticky traps low in the canopy. So if I get any low flying stuff, I get indicators of that. I'll put stuff at the top of the canopy and then I'll also put stuff up near the light so that if anything flies into it, I get an indicator of that. And that is a really easy way to find out that you have got insects. Bugs love those yellow sticky traps. They say, wow, look how bright that is. That's a leaf that is weak. That's a leaf that's got a weak surface that I can get in there and really start sucking the juice out of without a lot of effort. I want to go to that. So the bugs run to that yellow sticky trap and they go, oh shit, this is yellow sticky trap. I'm stuck here. And then we come in in the morning and we get to find out what kind of bugs were messing around in the garden, having a party while we were at home trying to get some rest. Yellow sticky traps are really affordable and they are a really early indicator of the presence of pests. So hang up your sticky traps, check them on a daily basis. If you start seeing things stuck to them, investigate what that pest is and treat accordingly. Then hang up fresh sticky traps and see if that problem has gone away or if it has gotten worse or if anything new pops up. But if you're going to use the yellow sticky traps, there has to be some sort of method to your madness. You have to hang them strategically, you have to check them, and you have to replace them. And if you see something, you have to react accordingly. So now we have two methods of finding bugs in our garden. We can use our own vision from scouting, and then we can use yellow sticky traps to assist us. Our next step is to learn to use our integrated pest management system to continue to prevent infestations, and we also need to learn what to do if a pest infestation should occur. In a strategic pest management system, it's always wise to have preventative measures in place. Why wait until we've got bugs to start treating 
for bugs. Let's make it uncomfortable and undesirable for the pests we know may arrive. Now, before we talk about options, let's talk a little bit about ethics. You can choose predator bugs. You can choose organic sprays. You can choose harsh chemical sprays. Whatever you choose to treat your garden is up to you. I encourage you to use something safe. Is it safe to you? Is it safe to the consumer? Is it safe to your pets? And is it overall safe to our environment? If you're going to smoke it yourself, spray whatever you are comfortable with spraying on your garden. That's yours. You can do whatever you want. I probably don't want to smoke it if you sprayed it with a few things, but if it's yours and you're sure it's not going anywhere, you can treat it however you are comfortable. If you have other consumers that are going to consume your product, keep their health and safety in mind. Not everybody is a young, healthy person. Some people may have underlying health issues that may be exacerbated by a pesticide or an essential oil or a botanical oil. Keep other people in mind if you are going to share, sell, or dispense your product in any sort of way. Then, of course, please make sure that your pest management system is environmentally friendly. We also need to keep in mind the long-term effects of whatever we choose to use. Beneficial mites will have a long-term environmental effect, but it is a much gentler effect than if we went outside and sprayed harsh chemicals. So think about long-term. Think about exposure, not just to the plants, the environment, the soil, your neighbor's gardens, but also to yourself. You've got to apply those chemicals or pesticides or botanical oils. Think about if they're going to harm you over time. Also think about, this is something we don't think about often enough here that I'm trying to gear myself more toward. Think about the ethics of the company that makes the products you were using. Does that company care? Do they care about the environment? Do they care about people? Do they care about cannabis? Are they opposed to cannabis? There are some companies out there that make products that are available at the hydro store that are completely opposed to cannabis and cannabis legalization. Why would we buy those products to support those people? So when it comes to selecting a pesticide, understand the company, understand the product you're buying, understand the active ingredient, and understand the effects of that ingredient in the long term. Understand what it's doing to yourself, understand what it's doing to your consumers, and try to understand what it does to the environment. And then really think about if that's something you can support, if that is something you would be proud to say you did, if that is something you would stand behind. And if you're proud of it, if you can support it and you'd put your signature on it, go ahead and use that product. Do what you're comfortable with. So now let's talk a little bit more about preventative. That's where I was headed with all of that. Preventative measures. It's okay to start treating for a pest problem before you see a pest problem. Why wouldn't we go ahead and make an undesirable environment? What are easy ways to do that? An easy way to do that is to already apply beneficial insects. Why not start a colony of beneficial bugs in our garden before the bad bugs even have a chance to take hold? You can start getting your persimilis, your Swarskis, whatever you decide to use in there. Do a little bit of research. Make sure that you order the proper bugs that work for your environment. Your temperature and humidity will play a huge factor in the bugs that you need to order. But get some predators in there. Get the army established and get them started before the bad guys can even get started. So another route you can take is by spraying pesticide applications. You can use your essential oils, your botanical oils, or you can use your light or heavy chemical sprays, whatever you choose to use. You can start applying them before you see an insect infestation. That way, if a bug does try to creep down the ducting, it jumps on the plant and it goes, oh, fuck that. I don't want to be here at all. And it just tries to run. It doesn't invite its friends. You can create that undesirable environment before you even get an infestation. I would start with a schedule and a strategy. Decide that you're going to spray every so often and then decide that you need to rotate your products this frequently and then set a schedule and a routine. And then if you see anything, you can step up your game accordingly. We'll talk more about scheduling and strategy a little later. Now, let's say we have been scouting and we have been doing our preventative sprays and now we have discovered some pests. Now, how do we treat them? What's the first step? The first step is to correctly identify your pest. On a commercial scale, it would save a lot of time and energy to treat for the correct pest the first time. So the first step is to correctly identify our pest. The next step is to think about how do we want to treat this problem? Do we want to use predators? Do we want to use horticultural oils? Do we want to use botanical sprays? Do we want to get in there with essential oils? Or do we want to step up our game and start using light pesticides or maybe even stronger pesticides? This is where we have to think about that. 
A lot of the essential oils and the hippie products aren't going to get rid of a strong infestation. That's where you'll need to step up to a mild pesticide. A lot of the pesticides are organic. A lot of those will work for you. If you've got a serious infestation and you don't want to deal with some organic stuff, you can step your way up to more harsh chemicals. But like I said, those are toxic and they become dangerous and you need to think about the ethics of what you are giving to other people. Now, if you're trying to stay more organic, if you're doing a TLO sort of setup, you can introduce predator bugs. Predators are expensive. You also have to have specific insects to battle specific insects. You can't just release one thing and expect it to go take care of any bug that you may get. So predators are an option. They're also time consuming. You have to get out there and let them go. You have to apply. They either come in sachets or they come in a bottle with like a little spout. You got to let them out somehow. They have to be dispersed through the garden. So they are time consuming, but they are organic. They are 100% organic. You're not applying anything to the garden that's going to change the flavor. You're not putting any chemicals on there that may make anybody else sick and they are completely safe. So you found a pest, you identified the pest, you've done some research on products that will help you get rid of that pest, either beneficial bugs or pesticide sprays, and now you've decided to apply that product. Now keep in mind, if we apply the same product to a pest too many times, those bugs will develop a resistance. So you'll see a bug, you'll treat it, it'll look like it's gone, it'll come back, you'll spray for that bug again, you'll think it's gone, a couple weeks later, it'll come back, you'll spray twice as hard, it'll come back and it won't show up for a long time. When it does come back, you won't be able to spray it down with the product you've been using before. You'll have to switch it up. So to prevent that, I recommend using multiple modes of attack. And don't forget that if the pesticides work together and don't cause a chemical problem together and don't disrupt the plant health, you can mix more than one pesticide in a tank together. I've done an episode about it titled Tank Mix. Don't be afraid to mix multiple products together. So you mix your products, you give it a good shake, you apply to your plants. I would say give it two or three days, then apply a different mix. Then if you still see the presence of bugs, apply a different mix. Don't go at it with the same product over and over because they will develop a resistance to it. Earlier, I said we would talk about scheduling and strategy. So let's talk about a more scheduled and detailed integrated pest management strategy. Here is a quick rundown of my scheduling and my strategy for pest management in a grow. Now, everything I mentioned is approved by the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division and also the Colorado Department of Ag. I cannot apply a pesticide that is on the banned list or that has not been approved for use in a commercial grow. So everything I'm using is approved by the state of Colorado. Now, to start my pest management system, every Monday, I apply a specific pesticide regimen to all of my vegetative plants, my small veg, my large veg, my mother plants, and the clones that are rooted and in pots. They all get sprayed with a pesticide. Depending on the size of the plant, I may spray them with a little more potent mix. I may spray them with a lighter mix. I may spray with just one product. I may mix up multiple products at a time. But every Monday, those plants are getting treated. I also write down exactly what I sprayed on each plant. That way next week, I know I can switch my pesticide. I can spray something different next week to prevent a resistance. Now I know that my plants have got a protective barrier. There's a little protection going on to prevent from getting pests in the room. If you're using lighter sprays, if you're using botanical oils or essential oils, you may want to up your spray regimen to twice a week. If those things don't stick around very long, you may want to apply them more frequently. So have a weekly spray schedule in place and try to switch up your products so that you can prevent your pests from building any type of resistance. Now, when you're in there applying the sprays, spray the undersides of the leaves. You'll notice the spider mites are on the underside of the leaves. Why not spray there? So start at the bottom of the plant and start spraying the underside of the leaf and work your way up the plant to the top and you will saturate the entire grow this way. Try to cover all of the plants just to the point of runoff, right to when they start dripping. Specific products will have specific guidelines, but I recommend you spray right to where they start running off. You just want to saturate that plant. Don't leave any desirable space for a pest. So get in there and spray once, maybe twice a week. And you can do this throughout the vegetative stage. Now, once we start approaching the flower phase, we need to think about what we are going to do for pest management during the bloom phase. In a typical commercial grow, I would generally apply approved pesticides until day 14 or 15 of the flowering phase. 
I may go in there the first day of the third week and hit that room one last time if I've had any problems, just to make sure those bugs aren't coming back. If you don't have any buds building yet, if you're just starting to get bud set, you should be okay with one final spray if you were selective with your products. Now, if you haven't seen any bugs, you can taper off your spray applications earlier in flower, and that's when we can start to introduce our beneficial and predator insects. Now, the beneficial insects work just like pesticide applications. You have to reapply them at specified intervals. Most of the vendors that provide live bugs are willing to set you up on a schedule to where you will receive the same order every week. That way you can rely on it coming. It'll show up at the grow. You'll say, hey, look, they're here. And then you've got to hang them because they're right there in your face. You can't forget. You can't put it off. They're alive. So that's a good way to get yourself on a good regimen and a good schedule of getting the live bugs out. So in a commercial grow, we basically work with spray applications until we see bud set. That's when we switch to the predator bugs. Make sure to taper off your spray application to where it doesn't destroy your predator bugs. Now, if you've been releasing your predators on your schedule and you start seeing spider mites, you can order fast release predators that will get in there and eat those spider mites for you. They come in a bottle with a little spout and they are hungry. You turn the spout, you open that bottle, you point that bottle at a leaf and the spider mite, the predator mites that are in there start marching out. They go and destroy the spider mite colonies. So if you start seeing an infestation during flower and you're already putting out the bugs, you just need to step up the bugs and try to ride it out through flower. You can defoliate, take any spider mite infested leaves out of there, get them out of the room. Don't go into a different room after that. Don't drag the bugs from the dirty room to the clean room on your clothes. Try to start the day working in the clean room and then work your way through to the dirtiest rooms and try to work on the bug infested room very last if that is an option. So if you've done everything correctly, you won't see spider mites late in flower. But if you do and you're using beneficial insects, you've got the option to apply more beneficial insects. I don't recommend spraying flowering plants with anything. Once you have bud set, everything you spray on there, you will taste it. If not in the flower, you will taste it in the concentrates. So if you do notice a presence of bugs late in flower in your flowering room and you were using beneficial insects as your pest management system, or if you're using sprays as your pest management system, it is time to step your game up in your vegetative areas. We need to eliminate the pests in veg because if you've got them in flower, they are in veg. And we need to start getting rid of them and having a clean grow before we move stuff into the flower room. Because like I've mentioned, once we get past week three, we can't really spray those plants. We can only treat them with bugs and that takes time to build up. So let's focus on getting the plants clean and pest free before we even move them to that stage. A lot of people try to focus on the flowering plants. They want to get those pest free. Those are on their way out. Let's focus on the moms. Let's go all the way to the beginning and get the mother plants very clean. Let's get the source material clean. Let's work on keeping the clones clean. Let's learn how to get the veg room immaculate. So that way, when we move into the flower room, we don't have to battle bugs. We don't have to battle pests. We can focus on building those fat, juicy buds and delicious trichomes that we're all after. Now, one thing I do recommend is write down all of your sprays. If you were working in a commercial grow, you were required to write down all of your sprays. You have to write down the date, the time. You also have to write down the name of every product and the EPA number of every product and the amount of every product that you applied. You have to write down the REI of each product that you applied. You have to write down the lot number of plants. There's a lot of documenting to be done in a commercial grow. I recommend you do the same thing in your private grow. Just for peace of mind, it's always nice to have records. And if you do end up working in a commercial grow, you've already got experience writing down what you've been using. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of people that will not agree with my pesticide spray application regimen. That is just fine with me. I like that people have different opinions. That's just the method that I use in a commercial environment. It's what has been proven to work for me. It has been proven to be cost effective and it is something that I can train other employees to do on a repeatable basis. Just like all other aspects of growing cannabis, the options for integrated pest management are endless. And as long as it's making you happy, as long as you are satisfied with the results, keep doing it. All right, podcast world, that is my quick talk on integrated pest management. I know I didn't recommend any products. I didn't recommend any specific vendors. I did not recommend any brands. My goal was to give you an idea of how to start your own custom-tailored integrated pest management. 
Now you know what to expect and you've got a few options on how to prevent and how to treat those things. Now you can customize that program to work for your grow, your budget, and your style. If you've got any questions or comments about this podcast, I would love to hear from you. My email address is at hotmail.com. If you feel like this podcast was educational, informative, or entertaining, and you would like to contribute to the show financially, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash growfromyourheart. All of the information you need to become a patron will be right there. Ladies and gentlemen, I made it 35 minutes without taking a break. My voice is burning out. I want to thank you for hanging out for this long episode. I'll be back Monday with a fresh new episode. I want to give a huge shout out to Stabby McStabberson. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me.